I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, and I study money. I've never had much of it, so I decided I'd try to figure out what it is and how it started by tracing it as far back in time as I could. I'm an archaeologist and an economic anthropologist, so I don't study how to make or invest money, but rather how it came about and the forms it has taken from the ancient past to more recent history. In previous lectures, I've gone over some pretty big questions. What money is, why it's so hard to pin down to origins, and some theories of how it may have developed. Mostly, I focused on physical representations of abstract money, for which I use the related but different terms currency and coin. Because these are physical things, they're easier to locate archaeologically than ideas are, especially in a time when there was little or no writing. In these investigations, I've shown that coinage entered our history around 600 BCE, but that currency was around at least by 3000 BCE. Money is essentially a way to quantize value, so it relies pretty heavily on measurement. Coins eventually become standardized enough that people could simply count them out, but currency was not stamped with its value or guarantees, so it had to be evaluated separately, often by weight. This means that standardized measures become of utmost importance in understanding early currencies, and consequently, balance pan weights have become a particular focus in my work. But weights in the archaeological record are not always recognized, and so I've spent countless hours going through various stone objects in museums looking for ones that might have been weights. This has led me to find many objects that are similar to weights but don't fit into a system and aren't quite right in their shapes either. Even though many of these objects turn out not to have been weights, they are extremely interesting in their own right. Most of them are what archaeologists categorize as tokens or gaming pieces. Such objects appear in the record long before coinage, before strong evidence for currency, and before writing. I'm convinced that they were initially used for accounting, so, even if they weren't currency, they were used to evaluate goods or resources, and thus, they might indicate the existence of a kind of abstract money. More specifically, they mark the beginnings of standardized measurement and mathematics, and they eventually lead to writing. They also have a strong social aspect as reflections of increasing divisions in society. Most people didn't understand the magic of accounting, and there's evidence that those who did rose to become the elite. Or at least that's how my theory goes, and why I'm titling this episode, When Accountants Were Kings. We don't know when people began to count. Humans probably had a general sense of number in their earliest existence. Languages tend to express general numbers as one, two, and many. Understanding and breaking down the many category is the magic of accounting. Tokens found in the archaeological record show us that people were counting long before they were writing. In the Near East, the use of tokens began between 9 and 10,000 years ago, not long after the domestication of plants and animals. At first, they were mainly made in a few basic shapes, spheres, rods, disks, and cones. Today, we might think that each token shape would equate to a position in a numerical system, say, ones, tens, and hundreds. But that requires an abstract understanding of numbers. Counting at first was connected to the thing being counted. In other words, people may not have understood the idea of three, only the physical reflection of, say, three sheep. This is known as concrete counting. Each shape may have represented a specific commodity, and there were very few commodities being traded at the time. As communities grew and the number of available commodities increased, more tokens of different shape became necessary. And archaeologically, we find that after about 4,000 years of basic token use, complex tokens began to appear. These are more unusual forms, but they're also basic forms that have incised patterns. Almost another thousand years go by, and then we start to get tokens impressed into clay, sometimes alongside the earliest writing. In fact, tokens may have influenced the development of cuneiform writing around 3500 to 3200 BCE. 
Such is the theory of Denise schmont Besserot, and at least in general, it's likely to be correct. But schmont Besserot believes that concrete counting reigned supreme until writing was developed, while I feel that a basic concept of abstract numbers may have arisen long before writing, though probably only among a small subset of the population. Concrete counting did occur, and was likely the main form for thousands of years. For example, a hollow clay ball, known as a bulla, was found in the 1920s. It was inscribed on the outside with early cuneiform that lists 49 animals, a record of Zikaru, the shepherd. Inside the ball were 49 clay tokens, each representing one animal and confirming the deal in a kind of double entry form. But numbers, when they run into the thousands or the hundreds of thousands, concrete counting becomes very cumbersome. Ancient people surely recognize this, and there are different sized tokens found even within the same site. Perhaps a small disk equated to one sheep, while a large disk represented 10, or 60, since the Mesopotamian mathematical system was based around the number 60. The shape might still be connected to commodity, but the size could be connected to an order of magnitude, showing a general sense of abstract counting. At Tepi Gaura in northern Iraq, spherical tokens tend to group in smaller, around 20 mm diameter, and larger, around 28 mm diameter sizes. And Schmott Besserot states that small and large measures of grain were counted with tokens in the shape of cones and spheres. At a minimum, this points to different measures of the same product, and thus the move towards standard conceptions of volume. The earliest numerical systems on the earliest tablets are complicated, keeping track of not just commodities like grain, sheep, and beer, but also of measures like length, area, and perhaps weight. I don't believe these systems were created at the same time they were written down, but that they were developing and practiced much earlier. In other words, I believe that the calculation and measurement had been conducted for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, with tokens. This long-term use of counting stones developed into different measurement systems that were eventually used on written tablets, with symbols that looked a lot like disks, cylinders, and cones. Evidence of the use of tokens as accounting tools can be found, or at least surmised, from the evidence at Tel Abada, a site in central Iraq. Here, archaeologists found storage rooms dating around 4400 BCE that contained groups of clay tokens stored in bowls. They were of mixed basic shapes, but not the same shapes or numbers in the different rooms. It's possible that this was a record left with the stored commodities after they had been counted and before the door was sealed. When the door was opened again, as needed, the bowl could be removed by an accountant who would then know the count inside the room. They could then add or subtract from the count as items were removed or added. This would imply that the different shapes represented not commodity, but pure count, with shapes describing orders of magnitude up to 60 cubed, well into the hundreds of thousands. The alternative explanation is that only a few commodities, one for each token, were stored there, and that they were of all different types in the same room, rather than one room for each commodity. Doesn't seem as efficient. Similarly, at Tepi Gaura in northern Iraq, in a period around 3800 BCE, there was a large building that archaeologists dubbed the Round House. It seemed to serve an administrative purpose, with its primary use being to store grain. In some storerooms in this building were found charred grains and tokens in basic shapes. Many tokens were found at Gaura, and some were found in graves. This, and the fact that many at this site were made of stone rather than clay, led Schmont Besserot to suggest that it was a special case where tokens were prestige markers rather than counting tools. But I believe they were counting tools that were also prestige markers, demonstrating the importance of the ability to understand and manipulate numbers. Nine tokens were found in a child's grave at Gaura. In fact, they were at the child's hand. This fostered the belief that they must have been gaming pieces. Two even look like chess pawns, furthering the connection, but a young child is unlikely to play strategy games implied by game tokens, and this was a rather young child, though not an infant. The child also had elite items like a gold rosette and gold and carnelian beads. The implication is that the child was a member of an elite family. At this age, 
they could not yet have distinguished themselves with deeds that would warrant gold items, so the status must have been inherited because of the importance of the family. Perhaps the tokens were a declaration that this child was destined to become an accountant. Through that association, the child was particularly important. But why was accounting so important? A society needed to know how many resources it had available to survive winters and even more severe times when harvests were poor. Pooling together was a way of staying alive. But as certain people came to understand how much the entire society had, they may have become particularly important. Not only were they the ones to take in the surplus for storage and to dole it back out as needed, but they understood how to do that in a way that would keep the community alive. They became vital to survival of the group, and they might also have had the ability to withhold, to grant extra, or otherwise to cheat the system. They were in control of the magic of numbers that most others did not understand, and as such, they rose to be an elite group. And did I mention that this same period where writing is developing is also the time when kingship and state-level society developed? Accountants may not have become kings, but whoever organized the accountants apparently did. Complexity had increased to a level that included long-distance trade, and gold and lapis lazuli were coming in from Afghanistan more than 2,000 kilometers away. Large numbers of commodities were being tracked in this expanding economy, and it was becoming a bureaucracy under a centralized leader. The earliest cuneiform tablets appearing around 3200 BCE are economic lists of commodities, receipts, and ration distributions. This supports the idea that counting tokens led to writing, as they served the similar purpose of keeping track of things. Symbols on clay would allow for a more concise record than a large group of tokens. So the theory is that basic tokens were augmented by complex tokens to record more things, then writing replaced tokens as a more efficient method of accounting. Did currency play a role in all of this? It's hard to say. There may have been some local commodities that were accepted in a variety of trades, but a standardized currency had probably not yet arisen. The main point of looking this far back in time is to show that counting, accounting, and measurement, all of which are fundamental to currency, was developing long before most people know. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford. Thanks for joining me, and join me again on another Money Lecture. And be sure to check out Note Nook, my series on modern paper currency. <laughs>